let's just see. Let's just see what's out here. What the heck? Hello everyone out there, nature lovers. Bob Ellis here with another episode of Notes from the Field. And you know what? I get a lot of claims from people. Some of them pretty outrageous, like, Bob, I saw a wolf in my backyard. And here's, here's proof. And they'll show, me, they'll show me a picture of a coyote. So I'm used to getting these claims. But I got a claim last night that is beyond the wolf coyote claim. It is bizarre. Someone claims they've seen a horseshoe crab in Arizona. I'm not buying the claim. So I asked the person, let me see the picture. And they said they didn't have their phone with them, but it was at a stock tank out in the Mugion Highlands. And they gave me the location. And so we're walking up on that right now to see just exactly what this thing is, and are there really horseshoe crabs in Arizona? Okay, so what's happened here is the, the monsoons have come. Arizona is blessed with this seasonal rain pattern called a monsoon, and this was an absolutely dry tank, cattle tank, about two weeks ago. Our monsoons came, filled it up, and now under the burning sky of the Arizona sun, we are searching for some unusual life forms that are able to sustain this kind of environmental regimen. Let's see, let's do a bottom dredge and see what happens. Maybe stir up that mud a little because they're supposed to at night go down in the mud and maybe they're down there right now too. Let's see what we have in here. Yeah, I don't see any in there. Let's try over here just to look at them. <laughs> look at those. There's so many of them. Let's put them. Let's put a couple of them in the bucket. Let's put one in there so that it's not too confusing. So all the tadpoles have gathered up here where they are feeding on the detritus. The wind is blowing it across the pond. It stacks up here. It's kind of a, a way of concentrating the food. And so just look at all those little tadpole mouths out there, just gathering the food. So these animals are part of the detrital food chain. Oh wow, look, there's a couple of those tadpole shrimp right there. There's one, there's another one. Oh, I caught a tadpole too. You go back home, we just want the shrimp. Yeah, let's put these in our bucket. It'd be great to find an enormous one. Oh yeah, there's a big one. Look at that. Let's go put these in the bucket. I think that'll, that big, that's big enough right there, I think. Let's put this big one right in there. Oh yeah, look at that. That's prehistoric, baby. These are some of the oldest animals on the planet. They've been around 500 million years or more. Males are larger than females. I love these little red shrimp, these little tiny shrimp. They're so cool looking. God, 
there's just so many. Oh my God, the productivity is kind of mind blowing, really. Right on top. Oh, dude, there's some of those big shrimp. The big uh, shrimp, those those things right there. Wait, where did they go? These, that's a different animal than those. Here's another big one. There we go. That's a pretty good mess of creatures. All right, let's see what we got here. And now I see why the claim of a horseshoe crab is a pretty reasonable sort of claim. Let's look and see what, what we got. All right, looks like we have three different types of creatures in here. There is the thing that we were calling, or that was claimed to be a horseshoe crab. And then this smaller creature that's swimming upside down. And finally, a tadpole. So, not surprisingly, this creature that was thought to be a horseshoe crab is called a type of fairy shrimp and this particular one is known as a tadpole shrimp and you can see why it looks like a lot like a tadpole and these organisms are crustaceans so they're related to crabs lobsters crayfish barnacles and they have been on the planet for 500 million years or so and what a beautiful adaptation all these creatures that are in this uh, sampling tray what a beautiful adaptation they have and that is this pond is an ephemeral pool and the reason that I know about these creatures is because I lived in Utah for a number of years and in the Slick Rock country they fill up with rain and seasonal rain they're called vernal pools and these vernal pools host all kinds of life once it rains you know the earth abides life abides and that's not excluded out here by this stock pond. This spot stock pond has been dry for probably two years during the drought. So you have to wonder how these creatures got in there. Well, the answer to that is they um, go into a dormant phase. For example, these, these fairy shrimp or, or this one, this thing that somebody thought was um, a horseshoe crab, what they do is they lay their eggs and these eggs are insisted. They're put in a cyst and this cyst resists desiccation and they can go three, four, five, six, who knows how many years. And whenever a rain comes, so comes the life. They hatch out of that cyst and they get busy. So you can see that some of these have, some of these tadpole shrimp, fairy shrimp have tentacles at the front. Those are the males. Males, they have they have sexual dimorphism. The males are larger than the females. And those, those tentacle type uh, structures allow them to grab a hold of the female during reproduction. They have three kinds of reproduction. There's actually parthenogenesis, where it's just females and they produce fertile eggs. And then, and this makes a lot of sense whenever you think about the kind of habitats they're in. There's sexual reproduction, which is not that very common. And then more common, it, they um, self-fertilize. They can be hermaphroditic. And so they can have both sexes and they don't need um, other sexes. They can just self-fertilize. So um, adaptations selected for, for harsh environments where it's very unpredictable when um, there'll be an opportunity to reproduce. You also see in here these other shrimp, and I don't know what these are. This, this creature is swimming upside down. It's a shrimp, and it's looking up. You can see its eyes, and that's the way they forage. The same is true of these fairy shrimp. If you came out here at night and they were foraging, you, they turn upside down, swim along, and capture detritus, dead organic matter, and they eat dead plant organic matter. They also eat dead animal organic matter, and here's a big secret. They eat each other. Yes, cannibalism. So another strategy for success. Another thing I want to point out is, and this is tied to their uh, genus name, 
they have three eyes on the top of their head. You can see those two eyes that are really visible and just right behind them is another structure that is a third eye. And so the genus of these organisms is called triops, three eyes, well named. A couple of other interesting facts about the tadpole shrimp is that they have a preference for eating mosquito larvae and so um, they're, they're helpful to humans in that way and in some parts of the world they're widespread. They're found in a lot of different environments. Um, humans like to see them because of that. Um, another interesting thing is a, the question of how did they get here? We're talking about a dry pond that's way out in the middle of an extremely arid landscape. So how did these creatures get here? And the answer to that question is that there'll be waterfowl and shorebirds that will use these watering tanks as sources for food in their migration. And so those cysts that I mentioned earlier, those um, eggs can attach to the creatures and their feet or other parts of their body and thereby they get transported and, and thereby in, ensuring a certain amount of genetic diversity because they get spread across the landscape. Let's see what's on the underside. What we'll see are all those legs that will push food towards their mouth as they feed. And this is the way that they feed. When we come out here at night, you'll see a bunch of red dots on the water and they're swimming upside down, gathering food and pushing it to that tiny mouth there. It's actually a beautiful creature. Look how primitive that thing looks. There's the third eye right there. That structure right behind the two eyes. Oh, beautiful, really. Well, folks, this is a great example of why natural history and the practice of natural history is such a wonderful pursuit. For one thing, I've been out here in this landscape for 24 years and I have not seen one of these fairy shrimp or tadpole shrimp before. And so you can know a lot about a place, but you can't know everything and there's a surprise around each corner. And so observations and observation skills are incredibly important in getting out into your landscape and poking around and trying to make sense of that world is wonderful. And you know what else is, next, is wonderful? A network. A group of people who are interested in the same things you are, like the people here at the Natural History Institute. Somebody lays down a claim, why, well, you can go out with them and check it out. So natural history is more than a museum. Natural history is a practice. All right, y'all. You know, as I return these creatures to their home, I want you all to Go down there and hit that subscribe button. Let us know how much you like what we're doing. And if you have a claim, one of these wild claims, like there's a wolf in my backyard or there's a horseshoe crab in a pond, why don't you go ahead and put it down there in that comment section and uh, maybe we'll do a video on it. Thanks, see you next time.